Well, thank you very much, Toby, and uh, welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, so thank you for the chance to talk about some things I've been looking into um, that arise from the two interests I have in both bioethics and also in uh, uh, my, my Cochrane work. And in looking at the evidence that um, has, has uh, been coming out, I think part of what we are dealing with at the moment is uh, the pandemic of un uncertainty that uh, practitioners around the world are struggling to understand just what is the evidence that I can rely on in order to inform my practice and similarly policymakers to uh, give guidelines to help direct people. And in the midst of all of this, there has been a lot of debate about ivermectin. This is an antiparasitic that uh, has been used uh, around the world, but primarily in uh, tropical regions. And probably its um, greatest benefit, uh, or at least most widely known benefit, is that around river uh, blindness, uh, a terrible condition which uh, the manufacturers Merck made available ivermectin for free when it became clear that uh, this was an effective treatment. So it um, has a long track record of safe and effective use for parasites or antiparasitic uh, in humans and in veterinary uh, uses as well. Early on in the pandemic, then, it came to attention as people were searching for existing antivirals um, or antimicrobials anti, uh, that might have a role in combating uh, COVID-19. And in April of last year, it was uh, reported that uh, it was effective in uh, preventing the replication of SARS-CoV-2. This uh, study was very clearly uh, labeled as an in vitro study carried out in the lab and also at uh, very high doses uh, compared to what would normally be given to humans. Um, however, the media picked up uh, this story in a variety of ways, uh, some reporting it uh, very clearly as being a lab study, but others not, and often not identifying the very high doses that were being used. And this contributed to growing popularity for the drug as a treatment, particularly in tropical regions and in Latin America. Um, it became so popular that human supplies ran out, leading to people starting to use veterinary products uh, on themselves, uh, which led to a number of adverse effects. So in April of 2020, the FDA issued a warning letter against using veterinary products and unfortunately had to reissue something similar this summer, uh, pr primarily for the US as uh, poison control centers have been increasingly uh, uh, receiving uh, people who have uh, had adverse effects to using veterinary products. Now, part of the literature around this um, was um, a preprint that appeared in April of 2020. Um, reporting uh, from uh, the uh, Surgisphere database, uh, which has become pretty notorious now, uh, but um, alleging that in uh, this database where they were allegedly collecting uh, patient data from uh, hospitals around the world, that patients who received ivermectin had a much lower death rate compared to those uh, who didn't receive ivermectin. Uh, they reanalyzed this in a case control series and found an even better um, uh, improvement in the death rates among those getting um, ivermectin in comparison to case controls. Um, however, um, a, uh, uh, um, investigative journalists and um, a, uh, an ivermectin a researcher and physician who had worked in South America as well as Africa uh, did a, a really careful analysis of this uh, preprint and identified um, a lot of inconsistencies, uh, some of which are, are noted here. But basically, what was in the original database um, was not uh, compatible uh, with what um, this um, uh, researcher and others were aware of um, in existence at the time in terms of, for example, the database reporting three patients on ventilators in Africa, when at the time only two were known or had been identified, neither of which uh, uh, resulted in uh, their need for ventilators. 
And so this uh, um, contributed to growing problems about the Sergisphere database, which uh, was then uh, the basis of two other publications um, in New England Journal of Medicine and Lancet, which I'm sure you're now aware of have been retracted, but highlighted the serious problem with the literature and with preprints as this push towards getting more data available, getting results out there sooner, which is completely understandable in a pandemic situation, but was leading to uh, reports getting out there, influencing policy and practice, influencing uh, the general public uh, before the evidence was available. And in this situation, um, what uh, is highly questionable evidence and it also highlights some of the ethical issues that we've been hearing as, about as well, where uh, the co-authors on these uh, Surgisphere papers um, appear to not have examined the raw data themselves and thus um, uh, not being able to take their ethical responsibilities to really look at what was um, actually in this database, if, if anything. Um, so this led to my own interest in uh, continuing to evaluate what's happening with ivermectin, and there's been a lot of publications around it. So I did a, a kind of a, a very quick search of PubMed in August to identify what information is out there. And this um, produced 19 publications, of which 10 were systematic reviews. Um, and meta-analyses that came to very widely divergent conclusions and led me then to, to kind of question what is going on here. Now, some of these differences are completely understandable with searches done at different times of the year with different uh, studies having been published, some taking on different outcomes of interest that they were looking at. But in two of the similar uh, uh, reviews, they came to completely different and opposite conclusions. The Corey et al. one finding that um, it, uh, ivermectin was highly effective in various outcomes, and they advocate that it should be used to prevent and treat COVID-19. And then later in this year, uh, a Cochrane review um, finding that reliable evidence does not support the use of ivermectin, um, except in well-designed um, RCTs. Um, and this conclusion um, agrees with um, a number of other professional and regulatory bodies around the world. But my question was, how could two similar reviews and meta-analyses come to such opposite conclusions? And it unfortunately leads to a perception among uh, busy clinicians or policymakers in the media that this is just a random spin the wheel type of situation. You just, the evidence, uh, you know, just is so variable um, and so influenced by something other than um, factual information that it's just a, a, a you know, a flip of the coin as to what you want to think is going on here. And so this is really problematic. So what I did then was to really look in detail at the way that this um, one review or both reviews came to their conclusions. The first uh, in looking at the PRISMA guidelines, the first thing to jump out um, is that the Corey review met only eight of the 27 um, uh, criteria that PRISMA 2020 has and plus two partially met ones in contrast to the Cochrane review, which um, uh, meets all of the, uh, the criteria, except for a couple of minor points in the abstract. Um, so this then I think should have led to greater concern in the peer review process of this Corey et al um, review. Um, and it led me to kind of look at it in much more detail. So the review evaluates um, all of the studies in four different categories. And I'm just gonna talk about the way that they um, uh, included uh, the randomized control trials in the first three of these groups um, to point out some of the, the integrity issues going on here. So in among the prophylaxis trials, they included three randomized control trials. Um, one of these is the al Ghazar trial that I'll talk about again uh, in a couple of minutes. Um, one of the other trials um, was um, identified in the Cochrane review, but has so many 
uh, high risks of bias in many different areas that it was not included in their primary analysis, um, whereas Corey et al. did rely on its results. I think one of the, the obvious um, things that should have questioned, led to a questioning of this, is that while the study planned to confirm the um, COVID diagnosis of all of the participants, Due to a lack of PCR testing, they were only able to do this in 16 of the 340 participants, thus uh, really questioning the reliability of those results. And then the third of the included reviews are studies in the Cori review um, is one in which it was not ivermectin alone that was used as the intervention, but it along with um, another antiviral. Um, the uh, Cori review included um, this uh, three protocols using three studies that use this protocol. Uh, the protocol they mentioned the two um, antivirals in the first uh, mention of this protocol, but then went on four times in the text and three times in their table of included studies to list the intervention as only ivermectin, which clearly it was not. Among the trials with um, outpatients, there were seven randomized controlled trials, but three of them used ivermectin plus doxycycline, um, another effective treatment. One involved hospitalized patients, even though this was supposed to be involving outpatients, and one did not state whether they were in or outpatients. Um, another included uh, in the control group, um, another um, intervention of unknown uh, effectiveness. So according to their own um, criteria, um, Corey et al. should only have included two of the seven randomized controlled trials, which is in agreement with the approach that the uh, Cochrane Review used. And then the last grouping was of inpatient trials. These had six randomized controlled trials. The largest was the El Ghazar one that I'll talk about now. Uh, three had this combination intervention, one had almost a third of its participants that had negative PCR tests and one enrolled outpatients with mild symptoms. So it should have been included in the second category, which is what the Cochrane Review did, leaving only one clearly eligible. So when uh, Corey then did their meta-analysis, um, and this is just the one on mortality, um, they combined uh, the randomized controlled trials with observational trials, um, which the Cochrane Handbook clearly states should not be done. And the two of the largest uh, trials um, that they included, um, one of them was not a randomized controlled trial at all. It was an observational study. And then the El Ghazar uh, trial is one that has been the subject of more controversy um, at the time, it was the largest uh, existing trial of ivermectin, um, but has been withdrawn by its preprint server because of other journalists and um, in, uh, researchers finding major problems ranging from narrative sections being copied from other sources to patient details uh, being inconsistent between the raw data and the report, and then also many data cells being almost identical raising serious questions about the integrity of this trial. So this has led to a uh, commentary this summer um, raising that a terrible question in many ways, that is it time to start assuming that healthcare research is fraudulent until proven otherwise? I think this has certainly got to the point where systematic re reviewers need to take seriously whether some of the data they're looking at could be fraudulent and there is uh, an, a, a, an integrity checklist now available to, to help with doing that and to spot red flags that should suggest this type of thing. But in conclusion, I think there is a, a serious problem here. The, now, the rush to publishing, I think, has exacerbated problems in the, the healthcare literature. But I think we're seeing that there is still a need to um, urge researchers to be ethical in uh, their authorship and their evaluation of what they're publishing, which could have avoided some of the retracted studies this, uh, this year. Um, peer reviewers, I think, need to take seriously or the process needs to be revised in order to ensure that peer review is finding the problems that unfortunately with ivermectin have only been identified after publication. 
And this puts a responsibility on reviewers and on editors to make sure that these evaluations are happening earlier. And then also for practitioners, uh, the media, and all readers of the literature, we need to have a way to critically appraise um, the literature as we're simply going through and uh, reading the literature so that we can determine for ourselves and for our patients and our, uh, 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 those following the policies that what is uh, being used is reliable and not subject to the types of problems that we've seen with the ivermectin literature. So thank you for the opportunity and I'll leave it to uh, take your questions later.